Well, good evening, everyone. Good to see everybody here tonight. Good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and start our service this evening. Glory to his name. Sing with me. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. tonight on this rainy Wednesday night. We had rain Sunday and rain today. Showers a blessing. And so I'm so thankful to be with you tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful to be gathered together on this Wednesday night for prayer meeting and Bible study, the Awana ministry. Lord, we are grateful that you are present, that you are assembled with us, and that, Father, as we worship and lift up the matchless name of Jesus, we can experience what it is to be in the corporate worship and corporate gathering to receive your word and know that you care for us, that you consider us, even in a time, Lord, when so many people so many people are wondering where to turn and where to find hope and, Lord, what to do next. We have the answer, and that answer is Jesus, and we thank you, Father. We thank you for that unspeakable gift, and on this Wednesday night, Lord, we just worship you, and, Father, I pray that you will bless your people tonight through the teaching of your word. Help us as we share and uh, bear and care for one another's burdens. That, Lord, we would uh, acknowledge that you have all power in heaven and in earth. And there's nothing too hard for you, nothing that you cannot do. And so, Lord, we magnify your name. And we thank you for uh, the song that we've already sung that just testifies to your goodness and your grace and your glory. We glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. We're going to sing another song. It's great to know, no matter what we're going through, that we have someone we can lean on. I love this old song, Leaning on the Everlasting Arm. Sing with me. What a fellowship. today and they didn't get out till late so I got a call this afternoon she wasn't going to be able to be here so what do I do I pick up the phone I call my son-in-law that's what good dads do huh and uh, of course unfortunately he's under the weather also and my wife said don't look at me so <laughs> I, I, so I'm going to do my best to fill in tonight I love this old song the pastor mentioned that no one cares like Jesus and I love that song. No one ever cared for me or cared for you like Jesus. Someone just jump up to Alpha. Sins 
and darkness from me. Oh, how much He cares for me. Every day He comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand His words of love. But I'll never know just why He came to save me Till someday I see His blessed face above No one ever cared for me like my Jesus There's no other friend so kind, kind as He no one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much He cares for me. Thank you, Brother Lynn. Thank you, Brother Daniel. I'm so glad that he cares for me, aren't you? Amen. Well, tonight I want to encourage you to remember our shut-in of the week. Miss Juanita Bigger Staff on Falston Road there in Shelby. And you can send Juanita a card, pay a visit. You can uh, call her. You'll have to speak loudly. But she has a special phone, and uh, that will help her to hear you. But it will greatly encourage her. Juanita sends out birthday cards to just about everybody on the membership roll. And she tries to stay in touch. And uh, I, I tease uh, Juanita from time to time. I, I say telephone, telegraph, tele Juanita. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, she would enjoy hearing from you. Uh, deepest sympathies tonight are extended to the family of Miss Virginia Marlowe. Now, Charles and Virginia came on uh, early on in my tenure here and were so faithful. They were here every time the doors were open until they became physically unable to be here. And Charles uh, passed away, his son passed away, uh, Virginia's daughter passed away a year ago. And after four years in nursing care facility, uh, Virginia has passed away and went home to be with the Lord. They loved the Lord, and they loved Bethel Baptist Church, and they, um, they loved Dr. Ezel. They were especially fond of Dr. Ezel. He gave them a lot of love and attention. And so uh, pray for that family. They have a son, David, and some grandchildren uh, that remain. So please pray for them. I'll be doing that funeral on Friday at 2 o'clock. Also, pray for me tomorrow night. I will be uh, preaching at the Sandy Run Biannual Associational, Associational Meeting. Uh, and uh, they've asked me to preach uh, on the subject of true salvation versus easy believism. Now, I don't know why they would call on me to do that, but it's one of my favorite topics. So um, you, you pray for me that God will use me to be a help in that associational gathering. Uh, Brother Doyle Ellison uh, has been under the weather and uh, needs our prayers, but in addition to that, his sister Elizabeth Lowry uh, passed away, and they will be having a uh, celebration of life service uh, at 11 uh, a.m., I would imagine, Saturday. That says p.m., but I, I believe it's a.m. Uh, Saturday, uh, January the 28th, uh, in the chapel at Cecil Burton Funeral Home. Uh, so remember uh, Brother Doyle and Miss Martha and that family as uh, they uh, bid farewell uh, to their loved one. And then I want to encourage you, this is the last Wednesday night in the month of January. For the month of February, 
I've asked Brother Chuck Reinhart to uh, speak on Wednesday nights through the month of February, and he is going to be uh, speaking, preaching, teaching on why I believe in the church. One of the greatest things that the Lord Jesus ever did was to build a New Testament church. There was a church in the wilderness, but thank God we've come out of the wilderness over into the promised land of Christian living, and we have a New Testament, blood-bought, heaven-bound church. And I, I, you heard me say all through the COVID uh, era that we seemingly still have fragments of that I would not want to live my life apart from the church that Jesus gave his life for. And so I'm really excited about this series and uh, excited about uh, listening uh, to the teaching and the preaching of God's word. So remember that. There is a baby shower coming up for Miss Ashley Rivera on Sunday, February the 5th from 2 to 4 in the fellowship hall. And so you remember that. Uh, one of... Um, the fundraisers that is such a blessing uh, during the month of January for the Pregnancy Resource Center is the baby bottle blessing. And uh, our liaison uh, is Brother uh, Larry, and uh, he's very passionate about this fundraiser. And can I tell you that in the Walk for Life and in the baby bottle blessings, Bethel leads the way in this county out of all the churches, well over 150 churches, Bethel leads the way. And you say, are you boasting? No, I'm just thankful. I'm thankful that our church is a giving church and that we believe in the sanctity of life. And so let me encourage you to get your baby bottle. They're available out in the uh, Welcome Center and you can take one or two of them home with you, fill it up with your pocket change, or just write a $100,000 check and put it in there. Just whatever the Lord lays on your heart, in obedience, give as a cheerful giver. The Lord loveth a cheerful giver. You know, and we're not just giving out of necessity, we're giving cheerfully because we love the work of the kingdom. And so remember this, uh, the annual chili cook-off is coming up uh, Sunday, February the 26th. And uh, I, I want to encourage you to be a part of that. That's always just a joyful night of fellowship and uh, tasting uh, a variety of chilies made by our people. And uh, in doing so, you help raise a little money toward uh, our young people going on the mission trip uh, toward the end of July. So remember that. Uh, our home sweet home couples retreat. Uh, is Friday, May the 31st through Saturday, April the 1st. And you have an optional night stay, a second night that precedes the Friday night on Thursday the 30th at the Music Road Inn in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And uh, our guest speaker will be Trevor Thompson. He and his wife Kelly will be providing the music and the teaching and we'll have a wonderful time of fellowship together. You don't want to miss that. Rooms are filling up. We were able to ascertain several more rooms. But please, um, if you plan to go, want to go, get on board uh, as soon as possible. On the back of our bulletin tonight, uh, each and every Wednesday night, we endeavor to go through this list and to call out these names. Uh, these are more than names. These are souls. These are people in the economy of God. Uh, in uh, a closer proximity of things, uh, they belong to our church. They're a part of our church. And we, we need to love them. And one way we love them is to assure them that they are not forgotten and uh, we will not fail them. So remember, if you will, Miss Linda Thompson there at Carolina Care Rehab in Cherville, and then at Cleveland Pines here in Shelby, Miss Mabel Shepherd at Fairhaven Nursing Home, Wilma Johnson, uh, Shelby Manor, Miss Joyce Morgan at White Oak Manor, Jerry Tessonier, Norma Lambert, 
we remember these at White Oak Manor in Kings Mountain, Mary Ann Green. And then at home, homebound, is Juanita Biggerstaff, Brother Charles and Sue Boone, Becky Bumgardner, Dolores Church, David and Betty Ellis. Uh, David and Betty have had some real trying days the last several months, and uh, I would encourage you to pray for them. And uh, though they're not our shut-in of the week, uh, a phone call, uh, a card sent with just a few lines that we're thinking about you, we're praying for you. Um, Miss Betty used to come, she'd sit toward the back with David, and uh, she'd want to give a testimony every once in a while, and she'd say, preacher, preacher. And she'd just get up and tell how good God had been to her. And every time I talk to David and Betty, without exception, They remind me that they pray for Bethel Baptist Church and its people and its pastor every day. And I believe they do. They're a praying praying couple. Uh, Brother Tommy Horton. Tommy was having some struggles breathing uh, earlier this week when I saw him. And so please pray for Tommy and Miss Martha. Tommy's uh, uh, been bedridden for quite some time. And uh, I know that... um, I know that this is a struggle for the family, but pray for them and pray that God would uh, touch Tommy's lungs. Bernie Jones, Brother Richard McSwain, uh, Miss Ann Mode, Brother Lawrence Oliver, uh, Sandra Stroud, Betty Tolbert, Miss Grace Wellman. I saw her this week, paid a visit to her, and uh, uh, I told her that I would report in to the church that she is still uh, the meanest woman in Bethel Baptist Church. She she wants to retain that title. She's 93, and she's not letting go. I'm telling you, she's something. Um, pray for our staff. We need your prayers, and uh, we, we covet those prayers. We, we truly do. Uh, in the hospital, uh, Richard McSwain at the VA rehab. Brother Steve Swagger is at Cleveland Regional, and... Um, That family is faced with some real um, decisions in the next few days. Heavy uh, decisions, whether to continue with uh, blood transfusion therapy or to um, discontinue that, uh, which would only allow uh, for Brother Swagger um, to survive at the, you know, by the hand of God. So please pray for Preacher Swagger, his dear wife, Brenda. They are precious. They love this church. Remember them if you can. Uh, We have some upcoming surgeries. Brother Al Corrali on the 10th, Brenda Champion on the 13th, and Barry Sullins on the 21st. So don't forget these upcoming surgeries. Uh, Resting, recouping, recovering at home. Brother Randy Allen, Mike Austin, Ben Barcliffe, Mildred Blanton, Scott Carpenter, Barbara Clemens, James Duncan, Jerry Elliott, Doyle Ellison, Bill and Becky Ewing, uh, Sherry Evans, Ken Flowers, Ronnie Goble, uh, Joel and Lois Hendrick, Betty Lemons, Erlene Leonard, Roger and Dorothy Lester, Kim McLeod, dealing with uh, fourth stage cancer. Billy Miller, dealing with cancer. Jeanette Patterson, Lacey Perrell, Gail Randalls. Uh, Steve Reynolds, uh, dealing uh, as well with blood cancer. Continue to pray for him. Uh, Kay Squires, Al Waters Jr., Tony and Linda West, Rose Witt, uh, with spine cancer. Steve Wright, doing some better, praise God. And Roger Weist who had uh, lip though, uh, tripsy today uh, at the VA hospital. So pray for them. Uh, he had a very large uh, kidney stone. And those things are monsters, I promise you. Uh, all right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, believing that he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all. Father God, once again, we approach your throne We are thankful, most holy God, for your goodness that leads to repentance, for your grace that covers the vast 
enormous sin of our lives and makes us before Thee righteous, worthy to enter into the throne room and to plead for Your help and Your grace in the time of our need. Thank You, Lord, for being so gracious, so good. Lord, help us to not only experience that wonderful blessing, but to extend it, to be kind, loving and merciful. Lord, I do thank you for the privilege to pray and to mention these names, Lord, that we lift up even now to you in prayer. These are people that are near and dear to us, people, Lord, that are sick or struggling, shut in. Lord, some have sorrow. And Lord, you are the God of all comfort. You're the great physician. You're the good shepherd. You're the one, Father, that we look to, that we lean upon. Lord, I think of Jerry McIntyre and his sweet mother, uh, Lord, who is in these last uh, moments of life. I pray, God, that you would be with him and all the family, and that, Lord, you would give her special comfort. Lord, I continue to pray uh, for these families that have lost loved ones. We think of the Oliver family, and Lord, we think of the Marlowe family. Lord, there are others that uh, have experienced the loss of siblings, like Brother Doyle. Lord, I pray that you will just bring your comfort, the assurance of your presence. Lord, your promises that never fail, the promise of eternal life. Lord, as we look into your word tonight, I pray that you would help me to rightly divide. And I pray that you would bless, Lord, this word that comes out of three gospels tonight. Three of the four. And Lord, we are encouraged by what we read. And I pray that you would use it for your honor and your glory, for the edification and the encouragement of those that are gathered here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here tonight. I want to encourage you. Yes. She did. Okay. I appreciate you sharing that. Let's remember Brother Jerry and pray for the Lord's comfort there. But I appreciate you being here tonight. I'm going to share with you tonight from the Word of God several passages that tell the same story. And I'm going to ask you tonight to be patient with me. Not that I'm going to be long, but I want to help you see something that the Lord has shown to me. Uh, and I'm so grateful when the Lord comes by with a handful on purpose and just lays it down in front of me and it blesses me and, and I hope it'll bless you. Now, maybe it won't bless you the way it blessed me, uh, but I sure pray it will bless you because I think it very significant what the Lord has shared with me and encouraged my heart to share with you. So look in Matthew chapter number 19, if you will. We're going to read three passages tonight that are going to sound very much the same because they tell an, of an event in the life of the Lord Jesus that took place during his earthly ministry and brings uh, to us a truth that we need to understand and a truth that we need to remember as we live out our Christian life and try to encourage others to come into the faith. Look in verse number 16 of Matthew chapter 19. And listen carefully to the reading of God's Word. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good Master, what good things shall I do 
that I may have eternal life. And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast. Give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, For he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily or truly I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Now turn your Bible to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter number 10. And I'll begin to read of the same account, shorter version, verse 17 to 22. If you have it, say amen. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life. And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come take up the cross and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, And went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Now turn your Bible over to the gospel according to Luke chapter number 18. And we'll begin in verse number 18. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, 
Yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God, for it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? And he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And Peter said, Lo, we have left all and followed thee. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Add your blessings to it. Father, thank you for these three times that inspiration has preserved the event of this rich young ruler that came to you, seeking what he would have to do to inherit eternal life. Father, you spoke to him about the law. Lord, you spoke about how difficult it is for men to let go of the treasures of this world to gain the treasures of the eternal world. Lord, help us to know. Help us to know what matters most. For what profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What has it profited him? Now, Lord, take these moments together and use them for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, each of these stories varied in length, some with more detail than others, but basically the same message that a man came to Jesus, even kneeling, even referring to him as rabbi or master or teacher. And he, he refers to the Lord Jesus as being good. And in all three counts, Jesus says, why do you call me good? None are good, save one, and that is God. So Jesus is establishing in the presence of this rich young ruler and all that were there, the disciples, listening intently, we find in the story, he's establishing that he is God. He does so in all three recordings. And then he converses about the law of God. Talks about those commandments of honoring our father and mother, not defrauding, not bearing false witness, not committing murder or adultery. And even in one of them, he mentions loving thy neighbor as thyself. But there is one little phrase in one of these passages that is not in the other two passages that caught my eye and my heart. And I'm just wondering in this setting that's a little more casual, a little more comfortable for exchange, did anybody catch what that phrase was? We read all three of them. I tried to read all three of them about the same speed without making any special emphasis on the phrase. But I'm wondering if anybody caught it. You don't have to be embarrassed by that because I've read those passages scores and scores and scores of times. 
And only this week did I catch the phrase that Mark uses that the others don't. Is Mark more inspired? No. Are the others less inspired? No. But for some reason, God in his omnipotence, God in his omniscience allows Mark to pin something that says something remarkable in the passage. And I'm going to read it to you. Can I do that? Look in Mark chapter 10. Jesus, in this passage, finds himself being approached by one that's running up to him, kneeling down before him, calling him good master, asking the question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The response by Jesus is the same. Why do you call me good? There is none good but one, that is God. And then he goes through the list of commandments. The law is important, but it's not the most important thing in the passage. We hear the confession of the rich young ruler. He said, well, I think I'm pretty good. I think I got those covered. And we hear that in all three passages, don't we? But look in verse 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Loved him. Now, boy, that moves me tonight. Because Jesus knew before the conversation ever started that this man would go away from him. That this man would turn away That this man would not repent of the God (laughs) that was the greatest God in his life, which was his riches. And there's no sin in being rich, and there's no attribute in being poor. But when your riches become your God, and you'd rather have this world, than eternal life, then your riches are your God. And yet, the Bible tells us here very specifically that Jesus looking at him loved him. What does that mean? Doesn't God love everybody? Doesn't God love everybody the same? I mean, those are questions that that are asked and there are answers to those questions and the answers might surprise you in truth. But in the passage, we find that Mark is giving us a detail that helps us to understand the very nature of God. 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. Do you believe that? God is love. And God loves. And nobody loves like God. Nobody. But in the passage, we're told that Jesus loved him. Now, this is God's love. This is not from the Greek philos, which would be Brotherly love, Philadelphia, the town of brotherly love. No, this is not philos. This is not eros where we have the Greek word for erotica or for erotic love or the passionate love between a man and a woman. No, our sensual love. This is spiritual love. This is agape love. But primarily and most importantly from the Greek, it is agapeo. And that word is strategically used in inspiration by Mark, which tells us that Jesus looked on him with benevolence, with favor, with grace, 
with good will. This is the love of God, a benevolent love, a giving love, a helping love, a, a beneficial love. This is a love out of good will, not willing that any should perish, who will have all men to be saved. This is God's love. For God so loved the world, the, the cosmos, the whole of humanity. This is God's love. This rich young ruler that loved his treasures more than he loved the good master was shown a love that supersedes all other love. And what kind of love is God's love? It's a gracious love. The word here, agapeo, is a Greek word that helps us to understand God's favor extended to one undeserving, to one unbefitting to one unmerited. There's nothing. I mean, all of these things he said, well, I haven't done that. And I haven't done that, this. All of that. All of that. Didn't impress Jesus. Jesus knew exactly what he had done and what he had not done. And Jesus pointed out his sin. Did he not? His love of his riches. What, what, would, what word would describe that type of sin? It was his idol. It was idolatry. It, it, it was a covetous heart. He, did, he, wanted that. It was, he didn't want to let go of it. He wanted the kingdom. And he wanted the king without any cost, without any repentance of the sin that gripped his soul. And it gripped his soul. He went away very sorrowfully. But God's grace was still there. So God's love is there. It is a gracious love. And it's a genuine love. Genuine. What am I trying to say? God wasn't playing games with this guy. God wasn't toying with him. Hyper-Calvinists would tell us that he couldn't have if he wanted to. That he didn't have the ability. And I think if that were the fact, then Jesus would have, in my opinion, and I'm trying to say this humbly, Jesus would have been laying out something in front of him that he really couldn't take, that he really couldn't receive. And to me, that would be disingenuous. But Jesus said, one thing thou lackest, repent of this sin, Re lay this God aside, come and follow me. You'll have riches in this world and in the world to come that you can't contain, come and follow me, take up your cross. Deny yourself. Follow me. That's the cost of the kingdom. Don't mistake it for a second. The cost of the kingdom is everything. We read in one of the passages, didn't we? That he who will forsake father, mother, sister, brother, lands, houses, wife, for the kingdom, for the Son of God, and follow shall what? Receive. in multiplication, far beyond anything this world could offer. You say, I thought salvation is free. It's free. The gift is free. It's not a contradiction. But you can't come and follow Jesus 
while you're following everything in this world. You can't prepare for the world to come while all your preparation is for this world. It it was genuine. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that God's love is tender. God was, he looked at him. Jesus, the son of God, God in flesh, looked at him, beheld him, the Bible says, and loved him with a tender, benevolent, gracious, favoring heart, with goodwill. It was gracious love. And it was tangible. Jesus was offering him something he could have. Jesus doesn't give you an eye hocus pocus. He doesn't give us pie in the sky. He, he doesn't give us some little crutch to lean upon so we can make it through life. He, he doesn't give us fables and fictitious things. He, he doesn't make false promises. He offers to us the greatest gift ever given, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's tangible. That's God moving inside, becoming Lord of your life, Savior, King, (laughs) sufficient for all things, a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, a shelter in the time of the storm, peace that passes understanding. A lily in the valley, the rose of Sharon, a bright and morning star, the fairest of 10,000 to our soul. The Prince of Glory laying down his life after living the life you and I can't live, dying the death that you and I deserve. I say it every time I'm in this pulpit, I make that statement. That's what he's done. And he is with very specific, (laughs) benevolent, favoring, goodwill, love, saying, here it is. That was genuine. Hyper-Calvinist would tell you that the firstborn to Adam and Eve, Cain, had no chance to be saved, no opportunity. He was non-elect, and he could not. Hello. No, I'm just kidding. He, he couldn't. Some would say he could not. Now, I'm just being honest with you. But God said to Cain, Cain, if you'll bring an acceptable sacrifice, you will be received. But if not, sin lieth at the door. Now, isn't that the conversation that God had with Cain? Wednesday night crowd, is that not what God said? Now, if if Cain could not, then God was toying with him. God was asking him to do something that he couldn't do. But the fact is, he would not. And the same is the fact with the rich young ruler. It wasn't that he could not, he would not. Hear what I'm saying? Jesus comes atop the Mount of Olives. Hours before he's arrested and accosted and arraigned and led away to execution upon the cross of Calvary, to be crucified for the sins of humanity. And there at the top of the Mount of Olives, sitting on the colt of an ass, he looks out over the Kidron Valley and all of Jerusalem and all that's in front of his eyes. And he says, oh, how I would have gathered you together. But you could not. Is that what he said? He said, you would not. When this passage tells us 
that Jesus loved this man. I'm trying to tell you it was a genuine love. It was a gracious love. It was a love that was tender, a love that was tangible. It was a love that was truthful. I've said everything I've said tonight to come to this point. I believe inspiration gives us <laughs> those two words, love him, so that we can see what real love does, what God's love does. A love that is of God, a love that is gracious, a love that is genuine tells someone the truth. This word, agapeo, comes with definition. It comes with direct connotation and meaning. Jesus is regarding him with favor, goodwill, and benevolence. But listen, this is not to be taken as doing what would please him. Telling him what he wanted to hear. Yeah, you're pretty good. You'll be all right. Just come follow. It'll be all right. Just come belong. Come belong. Believe a little bit. You'll be all right. That's not what Jesus tells him. Jesus is pointing out what real faith is. Take your faith out of your riches. You take your faith out of your religion. You take your faith out of your rituals. You take your faith out of your righteousness. And you put your faith in a relationship with me. You come follow me. Take up a cross. Follow me. Deny self. Come follow me. That's what he needed to hear. He, Jesus exposed his sin. Now you say, but he hadn't committed adultery. No, he hadn't. That's evident. He didn't even dishonor his parents. He didn't steal. From what we can tell of the passage, it would infer to us that this guy was confident that he could stand in the presence of God and say, I haven't done those things. Well, I've got a list a mile long of things I've not done. I'll just be honest with you. I do. I, I can honestly stand here and tell you I've never had a drink of liquor in my life. I've not, never had a puff of a marijuana stick. No, I no, just haven't. I mean, I can go... Down the line, I'm telling you what I haven't done, but I won't even begin to think about telling you what I have done. But he knows. And he knew, he knew that this man's wealth was the treasure of his soul and his heart. And it was greater than any other God that would be presented to him, even the Christ because he walks away very sorrowfully and rejects. He's unwilling to repent of his sin. This is a tender love, tangible but truthful. Why am I saying that? If you're going to love people with the love of God, you're going to have to preach the truth to them. Jesus didn't cut him any slack. And what to you and I might not seem as such a big deal. If the guy hadn't done all these, what's wrong with, you know, liking a little bit of, you know, a little bit of water cash in your pot? What's wrong with that? I think we all in a way could relate to that, couldn't we? Let's just be honest. But the truth was, that was his idol. That was his God. And God pointed it out to him. Now, whether your idol is sexual immorality, 
whether your idol is lust, fornication, adultery, whether, you're, whether it's pride, whether it's arrogance, whether it's, um, uh, you know, you don't want to respect and honor your parents. Jesus stated in the beginning, there is none good but God. He thought he was good enough. And God said, there is none good. He couldn't accept that. It was truth. We're living in a church culture where we want to appease the conscience that God is trying to afflict with his word. So we want to take the sting out of the word and say, you just come. Come, belong. Come, belong. Come, come be a part. Join the club. Come on in. Irrespective of the fact that you're unregenerate, unrepented, there are Baptist churches in our very nation tonight that open the doors to unrepentant unbelievers to, to belong, to hold position, to take steps. I mean, come, belong, be a part. But Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, says, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And what is the, the greatest love? It's the love of God, right? The greatest love is a genuine love. Would I be right in saying that tonight? If God's love is the greatest love and it's genuine and it's gracious, then we must be tender, yes, as he was. Jesus was very tender with this man. Jesus offered him something very tangible, something that he could receive. But Jesus was very truthful. And that truth would have been transformative. That truth would have changed his life. But he didn't want that change. We sing that song, I'd rather have Jesus than anything. What is the cost of real faith? Jesus lays it out. You know, it's the pearl of great price. It's what men are willing to lay down their life for, for the sake of the gospel. It's what men are, are willing to forsake all. I mean, the disciples looked at him and said, Lord, in this very passage, haven't we left all? And they had. Matthew had left the Tax booth, Peter and Andrew, and the sons of Zebedee, what, what did they, they left their boats and their nets. Did they not? And they followed him. And each and every one of them yielded their life, laid it down for Christ. A point tonight in a message that I would entitle a truth nearly missed. A truth nearly missed is that Jesus loved him tenderly, tangibly, truthfully, and it could have been transformative for him. I want to give you an example only because it's, it's in major headlines. But a pastor in Georgia with a big name has a father that has been a faithful pastor for 70 years, 60-something anyway. 
That pastor's son, who's a pastor, pastors multiple campuses, made a statement. And it's been all over social media. I mean, I've seen the video of it. I've heard exactly word for word, nothing taken out of context, nothing taken from a short little segment, and then you don't get the whole picture. No, the whole picture is right in front of you. Stated that unrepentant homosexuals love their heavenly father and want to be a part of the church, but the church doesn't know how to treat them and receive them. And though they're rejected, these are a people that will do more for the church than heterosexual Christians would ever be willing to do. That's what Andy Stanley said. He said it. Said it. And he said, well, what's wrong with that? It's heresy. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's social ideology. It's catering and capitulating to the sin of the culture. You say, well, pastor, do you you believe homosexuals ought to be mistreated? Absolutely not. But to love them with the love of God is to tell them the truth. To tell them the truth. Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And, And he even dismissed the passage of Scripture by, you know, Romans chapter 1, the book of Leviticus. He named several other passages. And, and he, he said, those are all interesting to talk about, but they're just clobber passages. That was his word. He ought to get a milk route because he doesn't believe the word of God. Real love is preaching the truth even if it hurts, even if they reject, even if they go away. This mentality, come and belong, be a part of, hopefully you'll believe and then maybe the behavior will come along in time. Is coddling sin and being careless with the scripture and offering a counterfeit to sinners. Church, we may be few and far in between, but if God will help me, as long as I have breath in my body, I'm going to preach the truth of the gospel. I'm going to plead with sinners like I did Sunday morning to come, to come, flee from the wrath to come. Jesus loves you. Jesus loved this man, even though he had an idol. All sinners, everyone that rejects you have idols. And one idol is as good as another to send you to hell. And that's just the truth. And so my point tonight is not to attack some other man or some other ministry. My point tonight is to show you that Jesus loved the one that would reject him. And he loved him enough to tell him the truth. Truth that could have been transformative. Father, thank you for letting me stand tonight uh, in these moments with your people. Lord, thank you for your love for us, for a truth that brought conviction, that heaped condemnation down upon our soul. Godly sorrow worked within us by your goodness that created within us the gifts of faith and repentance. And Lord, we called out, have mercy. And in your love and your favor, your benevolence, you gave us something we could receive, 
a gift truly offered, legitimately, sincerely, authentically laid out before us for the receiving. Lord, help us to preach a pure gospel, to be a lighthouse to a dark world. Lord, may we have compassion like you have. It's not mean, it's not unkind, it's not name calling and belittling, it's just preaching the truth tenderly, truthfully, so that men might take something that's tangible and transformative. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. Sunday's going to be a good, good day.